All right, I'm going to let you stay seated because I got a few scriptures to read to you this morning and I don't want those cute shoes to distract you from the word. Amen. If ain't nobody seen them yet, just tap your neighbor and say, look. <laughs> I get it. I get it. They might have missed it doing offering. They might have missed it. <laughs> so, tap them. Tap them. Check out the shoe ministry. <laughs> I tickle myself. One of my favorite books in the Bible, Genesis. God keeps taking us back to Abraham. And I know why, because we get introduced to Abraham and God's getting ready to do something real big for Abraham. I think that's what God is trying to say, say to you. I'm getting ready to do something real big for you. So he grabs somebody who didn't have a child and he tells them, I'm going to make a nation out of you. Uh. That's the most I'd ever ask you to turn to your neighbor, but turn to your neighbor. <laughs> and say, I believe I got a nation in me. Mm. Mm. I do. I believe. Mm. I'm waiting to see who catch that. I believe that what you see today does not compare to what you shall see from my life. I will go from barren to a nation. Mm. Put that up. Let's go ahead before I keep talking, Tina. Put up Genesis. Let me read this story to you. Genesis 12, 1 through 5. I'm going to go over to the next chapter. And it says this. Listen to this story. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives. King James says, from your people. And from your father's house. What a way to start a conversation. To the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Blessings are what? So I'm going to teach you how. And make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, let me stop. I had no, had no intention to do that. Uh, quit, quit, quit paraphrasing that part. You know, and the one who curses you, I will curse. Quit acting like God said, and those who curse you. Who, he said, one. God ain't in the business of cursing folk because they don't like you or you don't like them. That one he talking about is Satan. All right. This ain't the message, but it is the message. So quit acting like God going to get somebody for you. Because okay. most of the time you mad and you don't even know the full story. All right. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in all of you, in, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Verse four and five. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Where he come from? Now, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Herod, and Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Herod. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Flip over to chapter 13, starting at verse 5, and it says this. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herbs, herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling there in the land. That's, that scripture always cracks me up because that's God. Go back. Don't want you moving too fast for me. Canaanites and parasites were there. That's God saying, y'all showing out in front of company. Folk watching y'all fight. Folk, you're supposed to be winning. Watching the church not get along. All right, next slide. So Abram said to Lot, 
please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. If to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. There was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zohar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, listen, listen this, is this, this is the verse. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot has separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. Last verse. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. Go back to verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, when did God start talking again? I want to talk to y'all this morning from the subject. Why can't I hear God anymore? Any leaders in the house? Any builders in the house? Okay. You need to know why God shuts up. Let's jump into this thing. Let me walk you through it. See if we can explain some stuff to you. Now, in this decade, not just year, of accelerated vision, how many of you have come into agreement with me that God is ready to illuminate your vision? Anybody believe in that yet? Don't play with me. You, you, you believe that? I need you to understand some things about your vision. Watch this now. The reason God gives you vision is that God is trying to invite you into transition for the better. God is trying to invite you into change that will produce better. Y'all with me? Don't let your neighbor, don't let your neighbor disturb you now because I'm, I'm giving you nuggets out of the gate. He invites you into vision because, listen, he wants to invite you into transition for the better. I highlight for the better because you've already been going through change that you don't think was for the better. The old songwriter saying, we used to sing this in the Baptist church, he said, time is filled with swift transition. None on earth a move can stand. He realized something. The writer said, in this life, you're going to constantly be confronted with what? Change. Change. And so God says, because, well, let me, let, me, let me ask you this. How many of y'all cool with that, though? Y'all lying. And so you don't like stuff sneaking up on you. And God understands that about you. And so God, in his wisdom and his love for you, is trying to give you a way to get back in the driver's seat. He says, so instead of you always having to react to change that shows up, let me show you how to initiate change. Take this vision. I'm going to put you on the other side of the table and let you decide what will be if you'll just embrace this vision. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Because he's removing some of the anxiety in your life because he understands that you don't do well when you're anxious. Hmm. You really was born, you really, really were born to lead. And if you don't learn how to lead, you become rebellious. Because somehow you're going to take control. All rebellion is I took control ignorantly. Hmm. And so God shows up in your life and he's giving you this vision, but you need to understand this about you and about me. That by the time the vision comes to you, you have already been indoctrinated into your own world. Am I right about it? Let's talk about that. Indoctrinate. Put that up there for me. What does indoctrinate mean? I've been trained. Train you how to act like everybody around you. You were indoctrinated. From the time you got here, 
You were being trained, listen to me now, you was being trained how to be relational with your world. Because you got to remember, as a child, you had no say-so, no control over really your life. Am I right about it? You can take care of yourself, you can feed yourself, you can close yourself, and you really didn't want to be by yourself. And so what you had to learn as you was maneuvering through the people in your household, in your community, they had to teach you how to act so you get some time. Did I go too fast? You learn how to behave. Watch this. You learn what secrets to keep. And you learn how to be a grown up when you want just so that you can get some time. I'm, I ain't going to ask the question like that. I'm going to just make the statement. <laughs> Keep you from raising your hand. Some of y'all went to places you had no business going at a young age just because you was trying to get some time. Some of y'all to this day can tell us where all the liquor houses used to be. You know where all the stuff, you know, you know, you know where your daddy's girlfriend lives and your mama's boyfriend too. You learn how to wait in the car or stay in the living room. So y'all, y'all don't even want to act right. Oh, my bad. Holy Spirit said they nervous window. You saw you was exposed to some stuff. And so you learn how to be grown folks secret keeper because I still want time with you. So you begin to indoctrinate me in how to live. And so I'm watching how you relate to one another, how y'all move around one another. And here I am 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later, and I'm moving just like. Because you showed me how. To do it. And I wanted to be connected to this. So I, I, I learned how to lie. I learned how to keep secrets. I learned that whatever happens in this house stays in this house. I learned all that. I learned how to portray the public image versus the private image. I learned all the maneuvering and manipulating that I know because you indoctrinated me in a way so that I can still relate to my world. Here I am begging God to heal me from my original indoctrination. And so when God finally grabs a hold of you and decides, I need to reprogram you, he begins to talk to you just like he talked to Abraham. He asked for some real bold stuff, like you see in Genesis 12 and 1. Put that back up for me, Tina. So Abraham, I'm getting ready to do something great for you, but I got three places you need to get out of. I need you to get out your country. I need you to get away from your people. And I need you to put some distance between you and your father's house. That's asking a whole lot, isn't it? How bad do you want it, though? Because you got to understand when God is talking to you, sometimes he's not being literal. He's being hyperbolic. He's, he's using hyperbole to show you some things that shows you that you got to be able to do some stuff. One of the things you got to learn in this walk in faith, I got to be distant and still present. Meaning I still show up, but you still don't get to me. And so all of these things, all those three things are, are, are showing boundaries. And so the first thing he says, I need you to get out, of your, get out of your country. What are you talking about, God? Listen, e- even here in, in, in America, one of the things that makes, and y'all going to witness this, when those of you that go to Paris with us, you're going you're gonna to learn real quick, we ain't the only country in the world. But you've been indoctrinated to believe that all things circle around us. And then you wonder why people in other countries get upset with us because they realize you are not the center of our universe, America. And so when God wants to do greater things with you, if God wants to do global stuff, because several of y'all will run out, y'all will start a ministry, and y'all call y'all stuff international. But you're scared to leave the country. How you international and you ain't been nowhere but Charlotte? Because you don't even know how to relate to somebody too far beyond your border. 
And so God is saying to Abraham, as he's saying to me and you, I need you to think bigger than your shore. Whenever you go down to Verta Beach, you heard and go to the beach, and you stand there and you look at the water, you do realize there's other countries on the other side of that water, right? But you're at your border. You're at your place of limits. God says, listen, I need you to surrender what they told you was true to make room for what I'm about to show you. Country. The thing is, next thing is to get away relatives of people. Watch, this is the part that we've been struggling with lately. He says, listen, I need you to come out of your community. And I don't know about that because, you know, we, we got to have this black pride and got to stay with my hood, D25, Nickeltown, the bird, Woodruff. We'd be, we'd be calling out names, letting the world know where my border's in. Because you've been indoctrinated to believe that your loyalties have to stay there. Not realizing that by growing up, God is not making you disloyal. He's expanding you so you can go back and take something good into the place he pulled you out of. But until you have a comfort level of coming out, and watch this now, when you come out, you also got to have a comfort level of being misunderstood. Because sometimes you got to leave and you can't fully explain why you left. But I got to go somewhere and get something new so I can come back and maybe we can all be something new. And if that's not enough, the last thing he says to you also, he said, I need you to get out of your father's household. I need, I need you, I need you <laughs> to let go of what the ones closest to you taught. How many? <laughs> Just let, let's take a quick test. Do y'all remember when you was little and, you, and your mom and dad and grandma, whomever, did something to you? And you said in your little voice, when I get old, I ain't going to never, I ain't going to never treat my children like this. I ain't going to never. What you do? And sometimes you catch yourself midstream saying some of the same crazy stuff they said to you. Answer me! Shut up! <laughs> Parents throw you in a seizure because you don't even know what to do. And there you are, 20 years later, you mad, and guess what you sound like? Because you were indoctrinated. Just because you hated it doesn't mean you ain't going to repeat it. Because it's all you know. And when you thrust into similar situations, you pull up all you know. God says, if I'm going to show you that you're bigger than what you think you are, I need you to put some distance there. I'm not telling you to abandon them. I'm not telling you to give up on them. I'm saying, come out for a minute. Let me show you something. So you can go back and tell them that the world isn't flat. And so watch this. In this reprogramming process, God has to confront you in those three areas. My country, my people my father's house, because he wants to do this. Write this down, note takers. He's trying to shape your perspectives and your loyalties. Your perspectives and your loyalties. Because until he gets to that, he can't get to you. You can be saved and still not changed because you won't give God access to your perspectives and your loyalties. Let's talk about that. Watch this. This first one is big. What is your perspective? Put that up for me, Tina. Your perspective is how you see your world and how you see you in your world. And by the way, you weren't allowed to form your own opinion. It was handed to you. 
And so you see your world as you have been taught to see your world. And therefore, you also see what role you are allowed to play in your world. And so therefore, you might be stuck in that same role 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years later because that was the first thing you saw. And so before God can do something greater than greater in your life, he has to convince you that you're not who they always called you. Am I making sense? Let's make it real personal. How many of you now, you know, a little, little seasoned like myself, you know, you past 25, 30, 40, 50 years old, and when you, when you go back on the holidays, they still treat you like you little somebody? <laughs> you still ain't graduated from the kid table? <laughs> Here you are. You got a mortgage, you got all kinds, got your own children, but their conversation with you is like you still. And you mess around and try to state an opinion. They remind you how many diapers they change, how many this, that, and the other. Am I right about it? Because this is the role that you've been asked to be relegated to. Here you are trying to be big, but I can't be big for y'all making me small. And so God has to begin to say, tell me what your world looks like. Tell me the borders, the boundaries of your world. Then tell me what they said you can be in your world. He said, because we got to change that because who they called you ain't who I called you. So we're in conflict from the gate. And if changing your perspective isn't enough, we got to go a little deeper. He said, now let me deal with your loyalties. Put that up for me. Loyalty means your allegiance or your sense of obligation. They go hand in hand because you feel obligated to be who they called you so you can stay in relationship. Did y'all hear me? I'm obligated to be who y'all expect me to be. We talked about this during the prayer this morning. Let me take a quick poll. How many of y'all are the go-to person in the family for everybody's problem? Okay, hands down. Everybody raise your hand. How many of y'all sick of that? But if you but you know that if you stop being it. What happened the last time you tried to stop? That's my that's my prayer this morning was like, Lord, strengthen my no. Strengthen our no. So that my no means no. And my yes means yes. Strengthen my no. My yes comes out real easy. It's that no that I get choked on. And so you feel obligated to stay in the role that they've given you. And so to bring that part of your life to an end and to introduce you to the next phase of your life, God's got to challenge your perspective and your loyalties. I've got to show you your world is bigger than what you're claiming at the parties and what you're throwing up and saying, I'm from this place and another. We ought to be, it. We ought to be when folks say, where you're from, you ought to say eternity. Is there a sign? For, what's the sign for it? I'm from the place where there's no dimensions. Where are you from? I'm from the place that I can do all things. There's no boundaries, no, 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 no stopping points. That's where I'm from. I'm loyal to where I came from, and, and I just came through this place here. Hmm. And so as you begin to work your way through these areas, hmm, it gets harder. It gets harder. And see, some of us in here, God's got great callings on your life, but you're scared to leave your country. Got great callings on your life, but you're scared to leave the limitations of your people. You're scared to leave the generational thinking of your father's household. And there has to be a stop to your indoctrination. And so when we get to Moses, not Moses, Abraham, Abraham did good at number one. Get out your country. He threw up the deuces. Get away from your people. He got past that too. But that third one, get away from your father's house. That's where he got stuck. And see, listen. God's all right with all of that. I don't want to throw anybody off because some of us drag stuff with us that we shouldn't. But I need you to understand this. Is that my timer? 
I know. I, I didn't know. I was, when y'all ready to go, we can go. <laughs> that worship filled me up. So I'm going to go. <laughs> I need you to know this as we're chasing this right here. Listen to me, leaders. You cannot, you cannot pursue righteousness without your stuff coming up. Don't, 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 don't raise your hand. I don't want to get you in trouble, but just wink at me. Uh, since you gave God a yes, have your struggles increased? Just wink. Don't wait. Don't, don't, don't. Just, just wink at me. Just, I don't need your neighbor to know you're struggling. Because you're trying to move, but with, with, listen, as you move into the things of God, God is purging you. And if you don't understand this process, the enemy can convince you that you're weaker than you were before you said your yes. Am I making sense? Because before I become whole, I got to see what I've been contaminated with. And so we see Abraham going through this thing. And one of the major things that comes out of Abraham's story that I think is true for most of y'all in here, and y'all, y'all can give the Lord a hallelujah on this one, my main stuff is that my family has a grip on me. Hmm. And God is confronting that indoctrination. My problem is this. I haven't figured out how to love them without becoming them. Hmm. And so you have this situation that Abraham brings Lot with him, and Lot was not his responsibility, Kim. He was not. Lot was actually his daddy's responsibility. Terah had died, who was Lot's father. And so he began to, he, he had to, uh, Haran had died, who was Lot's father. And so Terah, the daddy, was supposed to take responsibility for Lot. But I guess Abraham decided he wanted to do be kind like many of you do and try to take on some responsibility that's not even yours. But if we dig a little bit deeper in that, we can find out why you do that. You're trying to take on more than is your responsibility because you're still trying to figure out how to relate. Imagine the conflict of saying I'm getting ready to leave and you try to make it easy for you to leave by taking somebody with you. You're still trying to win folk over. But here's the thing I need you to understand, that as you move in this thing, and you will be moving in this thing without all things together, with all, without all gears coming, it is your flawed yes. Mm. The fact that you gave God a yes is what unlocks his provision and his protection. I need you to get that. Because some of y'all won't move because you know you ain't got it all together. And you're somewhere trying to fix you, not understanding that the process fixes you. It's the fact that you're moving key is what begins to heal you. Because some of y'all, you know, you don't have babies and had surgeries, and, and, and within 12 hours, what they got you doing? Moving. Because the movement facilitates the what? Healing. And so when God wants to heal you, that's just man finally keying in on what God has always been doing. To get you to a better place, I got to get you moving. And as you move, watch this. God does provide provision and protection. Because if you know the story, I didn't want to read it all to you. But after he and Lot left and he took Sarah and all of this, the Bible says they went down to Egypt. So you how flawed Abraham is, and you can tell your neighbor that God really has called you, even though you know you still got some stuff. They went down to Egypt, and y'all know the story. The king of Egypt saw who? Sarah. And Abraham told Sarah on the way down there, look at here, girl. When we get down here, they're going to see what your mama gave you. And they're going to want you. I need you to protect me. Flawed brother. And tell them you're my sister. 
Was God surprised by that move? Was God surprised by any of yours? Why do you keep acting like he's taking the calling? Did you mess up after you said yes? Why you quit then? As if you did God a favor by quitting. God wasn't surprised by nothing you did. But watch how God handles Abraham in this. And see, here's, here's the thing that your haters hate. Because sometimes God will reveal to people your flaws. And they're sitting somewhere waiting for God to get you. And he turns around and bless you. And they can't figure it out because they're zeroing in on your behavior that they know, but they weren't present for the yes you gave. It was my yes that unlocked the protection and the provision. Because here's what's so funny about it. When Abraham did this, the king did what? He took Sarah into his chamber. He took her, took her to the king, to the castle and all that kind of stuff. And what did he do for Abraham? He gave him all this stuff. Go read it. He says, you know, Sarah was so fine that the king emptied his checking account. <laughs> like, bro, I appreciate it. Here, take this, take this, take this, take this. It's in the Bible. Provision. You'll be amazed how God will give stuff to you. And then after that, God steps in and he protects. God made somebody who didn't even believe in him realize that God was upset with him. And so the king said, yo, man, why you ain't tell me this was your woman? And God moved in such a way that he said, listen, take your woman and the stuff. And so he walks out of Egypt with his wife and with wealth. <laughs> I told you, that's for your haters. Because they're trying to figure out, why do you still keep being blessed? Why does God keep using you? Let me show you why scripturally. Uh, 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 Acts, Acts 17, 28. For in him we what? We live, move, have a being. Live. When I said yes to God with my flawed self, I begin to live. The purpose of the vision was to inspire you. The word inspire literally means to breathe life into. So until you grab the vision, you're just like Adam in Genesis before he received the breath of God. You were formed, but you weren't alive. And so the moment I said yes to God, I had a reason to live. I hear you, Holy Spirit. Pause. I heard the Holy Spirit say right there, for some of you, you can stop, you'll be able to stop taking antidepressants when you finally say yes to what he said. Because you can you get to the place you don't need medicine to encourage you to live. <laughs> Am I making sense? I don't know who that's for. That's for somebody. And so now I'm living, and the moment I begin to try to do this, I'm moving. And in my moving, my moving is what makes me become. But it's in the area of my moving that God has now invested in me. And he has invested to get me to my expected end because now his glory is attached to me. And so he has to maneuver and do things and change things and alter things because he's still trying to get his glory up out of me. He's not looking the other way. He's not, he's not giving me a get out of jail free pass. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But I need you to understand God still obligates himself to provide for you. Because he's still trying to get you to the place. And he intervenes because of my original yes. And so Abraham comes out of this thing wealthy. God is increasing you as you move. For those of y'all who are operating now in your vision, what, no matter where you think it is, whether it's in its infancy, whether it's in its maturity stage, has not God provided for you? He's made connections. He's provided resources and opportunities that you couldn't afford on your own. 
Because he's still developing that yes you gave. And he sees you. And he sees your struggles. And so God is perfecting your inner man while also blessing your outer man. Sometimes you have to admit, man, people treat me better than I'm acting. Because God is making me look so much better than I am. Because he's committed to getting his glory out of me and getting me to this expected end. Where am I in this? And so as God begins to do this to you, here's my advice to you. Listen to this, because it took me a while to get this. Hmm. Abraham is still more committed to pleasing people than he is to pleasing God. Because watch this. If you remember the text, God told Abraham this, and I need y'all to hear this, and I thank y'all for letting me just walk through it and not scream and yell at you and make you run. I got to get this in you. God told Abraham this. He said, I will bless your offspring. Hmm. But if you read the text, Abraham was given what he had to lie. Put 13, 5 through 7 up for me, team. Now, Lot, who went with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents and the land and all this kind of stuff. And down to seven, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham livestock, all of that. Question. Where Lot get his stuff from? Lot didn't have stuff. Everything, listen now, because here, here we're going we're gonna to get a little uncomfortable right here. Abraham gave Lot what God gave to him. And that seems nice until you realize Lot wasn't supposed to be there. Leaders, when you bless people who aren't really supposed to be there, it begins to show real fast. See, I know you think because I'm giving you some stuff, it's going to change your perspective and your loyalties. It's going to make you appreciate me more as your leader. It's going to make you more loyal to the things I'm doing. I'm just making sure you see that I care about you and I love you, and so it's going to produce a better worker. But that never works, does it, D? If they ain't supposed to be there. How many times have you given of yourself to somebody and they were just glad to take it? And you somewhere sitting waiting on reciprocity. And they looking at you crazy. Like... I just thought you wanted to give it. As long as you was given. But this was supposed to watch this. This was supposed to be set aside for his seed. It was supposed to be set aside for what comes from him. It was supposed to be set aside for what or who is actually connected to him. And he was giving it to somebody who was just along for the ride. Listen to this, y'all. If you are under, because he said he had cattle, he had land, he got tent, and he even got people. That's what's wrong with all of that. Because listen, if you are under a vision of someone else, you are not an owner. You are just a steward. You don't own nothing. You've been entrusted to look after it. Let's make it real personal. Watch this. You can't be a member in CYM and have sons and daughters in here. Let me let that settle a little bit. How is there one spiritual father but you got sons and daughters? There ain't no ownership. There's stewardship. Let me make it real personal. Let me see if y'all really get it this way, because maybe you don't understand the church talk. Let's go to your house. If your son or daughter, let me talk to the bros first. Fellas, 
If your son or daughter gets married, they got to move back in your house, Milk. You give them a room, give them all that kind of stuff. How many men in the house is it? But, 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 he, but, he, but he grown though, right? He grown. He in, he, but he, 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 he over 25. What if he 30? What if, and he in your house. So now how many, it's got to be at least two men in the house, right? Don't you confer with him before, before you making decisions about the house? Why not? But you gave him a bedroom and you gave him all that stuff. Ain't that his? So he, he, get, he get to use the soap and the towels and the sheets and all that. He get to go to the refrigerator, get to do all the stuff he needs to take care of himself. But who run it? What's going to happen, Milford Show? Sure go, this is my house, too. <laughs> when I'm under someone and they give me access that's all they did was give me access and if I was smart and I'm in my father's house I would take care of the stuff like it's my inheritance. I know I paid a mortgage at, at, at 510 people on golf course. Well, I know I paid the bills and all that, but if Leah and Wendell and Ben and all that, if they smart, they won't tear it up. Because at some point, what's that is will be mine. And so you protect it because I don't need to do nothing crazy so rain can come through the roof. I don't need to do nothing crazy to put us all in danger because I didn't take care of the things that he allowed me to store. But here we have Lot. And he got his own people. And so what happened in the text? He decided he has their own people. And the scripture says there was strife. And there was division. Watch this. If you didn't notice something, during all of this, God said nothing. God didn't correct him. He took Lot and God didn't say, oh, excuse me. Uh, send him back. God didn't say none of that. God sat there. Listen to this. Here's what I've learned about God. God will talk to you and shut up on you because there is correction in the process. He ain't got to show up, do nothing to you. It's built in. It's built in. When he got beside himself, the thing he took that he shouldn't have taken became a nightmare for him. Having to let go of what he walked from caused pain. Having to deal with a lot over and over again caused him pain to the point where he's begging the person he's taking care of. That's what's wrong with parenting now. We're busy saying, please, the children who live with us. I'm negotiating with you, and you ain't contributing to no bills. It calls the schism. The pain of it began to correct him, so God didn't have to correct it. And so in Genesis 13 and 14, you see what begins to happen. He went through all of that, and he began to discover why God wasn't talking. God was blessing, but not talking. I don't know about you, I'd rather have God talking to me than giving me things. The Lord said to Abraham, Abram, after Lot has separated from him. What's so amazing about this story is that if you read the rest of your Bible, however you handle what you're under, it's going to come back to you. 
Because if you know the rest of the story, this whole notion here, I done took you from your father's house. And now you're rebelling against me to the point where you got people? How you got people in my camp? How you got people that's feuding with my people? And truth be told, I'm feeding all y'all. And so in order for them to have people, Lot was teaching them to rebel against Abram. And see, here's the thing they don't bargain for. That when Abram finally gave them the green light to leave. What's amazing about folk who lead rebellions, they get somewhere and now they won't order. But the people that follow them say, that ain't how you taught me to relate. My indoctrination was to rebel the leader. And so if you fast forward, this lot who thought he was getting the best of the land ended up where? Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, now he's surrounded by folk who don't want to do right. So much so that the story says he's got to run from the folk he let off. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. So I've come to understand this. Don't even be worried about that too much because what did the scripture say about that? Where is it? First John 2, 19. It finally, it finally makes sense to me. He said, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. Of us. Not your seed. And so if they're not your seed, they shouldn't be partakers of your inheritance. Let me get away from my nose. One of the things I've had to learn and grow up in this position of minister is that it had to reveal to me that I still had that only child complex. Where I was still, as my mom used to tell me all the time, trying to buy friends. And so in this ministry, what has stagnated us on many occasions is that I promoted people just to show them how good I was. And I put people in a position who weren't of me. They were just talented and skilled. And truth be told, what they were really doing is trying to use us as a stepping stone to get to where they wanted to be. They want to use us as a place to practice on us, then leave us. Is that too much? And so what I've had to learn to do with this is be slow in creating positions. I had to ignore you. We need this, we need this, we need this, we need this. No, I need somebody who's connected to us. That's so why I have people who show up and I got someone in here today who ain't of us. They hoping to use us. But the reality of it is, is that this inheritance is not given to you. It's only given to those who are connected. Oh, we ended the year on a bang. Because if you're not committed to where we're going, we will not waste wood on creating a platform for you. Oh, y'all going to talk about me today. <laughs> but the blessing of 13, 14 is this. is the moment that Abel made that hard decision. God not only began to talk again. He said, lift up your eyes. God has to talk to leaders like that sometimes, Travis, because the decisions we make are painful. Because the moment you have to do something that causes a disconnect, you can't do this and not love people. And so that thing hurts you. And God has to keep showing up. Lift your head up, son. Because if I don't lift my head up, Lift your head up, son. But God, they talk about me. Lift your head up, son. But God, they're walking out on me. Lift your head up, son. I'm too busy with my head down thinking about the people. He's trying to show me the land. Lift your head up. He said, if you get out of the depression, let me show you. 
what I still have for you. I'm using us as an example to help you with your journey because I've, got to go I'm, I've gone before you and you'll be coming after me with your own. you got to understand this. You can't take lot with you. You have to obey what God said to you in the beginning. And see, here's what I think about most of us here. Watch this and we're done. God is still blessing you. Who's, who's, who's operating in your vision? And I, I so appreciate y'all patience today because we're just talking. Okay? Here's what I've learned. You know when Jesus later on talks about this 30, 60, 100 fold blessing? Mm-hmm. I've come to realize this, is that if I'm, if I'm, if I'm obedient enough, key, to get out of my country, I get 30. And see, some of you think you're doing well, but you're just operating at 30. But it feels good because it's better than what you had. If I can get past my country and also get past my people, I go to 60. 60 is way better than anybody else has ever done, but you're still falling short of the glory. But if I can get back to the place, if I can get to the place where the influence of my generational curses no longer touch me, I hit 100. 100 what? I finally meet me. Some of you are just at 30% yourself, 60% of yourself. You ain't got 100. And the thing is, you can, you, here's what I know about you because it's the same thing happening to me. Watch this. Does, does anybody ever get the same sense? That you almost caught you. I know it sounds crazy to some, but if you're in pursuit, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, I'm almost there. And you can also tell when you backslide from you. When you start making decisions that aren't in alignment with the betterment of yourself, still trying to please folk, you shift right back from 60 back down to 30. And you're grateful, but you know I'm better than this. And see, you're so afraid to grow because it does cause separation. Jesus said it would. Daughter against mother, father against son, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. You can't handle the season of disconnect, not knowing that God is disconnecting you for the purpose of removing your indoctrination so you can go back and feed them right. Because here's something I know about this. When God begins to deal with you, it does not make you dislike your family. It makes you love them more. It makes you understand them more. It makes you begin to see why y'all are the way y'all are. And it makes you want to go get healthy so you can go back and get them healthy. And it's not about abandonment. It's about being perfected so God can use me to go back and snatch them out one at a time. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. But you got to have the courage to be misunderstood. You're wondering why God ain't talking. Because you're still trying to do it your way. He said, don't take Lot. But me and Lot been together forever. Don't take Lot. But God, I know if I just have a little time with him, I can, I can work with him. I can love him a little bit deeper and they'll get it right, God. I just need a little time. Leave them. And you think you leaving them as punishment to them as if God don't love them too. Truth be told, if you take them, you're in the way. If you let them go with you, you're in the way. You think you're being a blessing. You are being a hindrance. There's so many folk you've been propping up that God been trying to make fall. Because he's the one that reaches to the uttermost. You're still propping them up, and you think you're doing it for them, but truth be told, you're doing it for you. It ain't about them. It's about you. You worried about how they're going to feel about you. Lord, strengthen my no. Strengthen my no. I'm going to just stop right there. Put the takeaway up there. My disobedience to what he said begins to hinder my ability to hear God clearly. But he factored that into the plan. Because remember, he understands my frame. As I told you last week, he knows I'm but dust. He factored that in. He has placed correction inside of my journey to righteousness. Because he loves me, he's also placed blessings along the way. 
as I release whatever I need to release, the vision becomes clearer. Abraham was able to get over his depression by God showing him where he was going. And Abraham was going to do something to not just bless Lot. He was going to do something to bless his bloodline. Sometimes you're, sometimes you're forfeiting a family blessing because you're still trying to take care of one member. If God said, leave them there, trust that you left them with him. With him. Go forward and become who you're supposed to be so you can come back strong. Am I making sense? Thank y'all for your patience. Come on, stand. Why can't I hear God? Because I'm doing something I'm not supposed to. We're on the verge of a great decade. I got to soak up your tools so you can walk into this and form. There will be Sundays, hear me, that will be emotional and hyped and celebratory. But there will be times where we got to sit and have a family meeting and give it to you straight, clear, logical. Because when you walk out of this, this message is coming back. Lot isn't always a person. Lot is sometimes a belief. Lot is a practice. There's some stuff God says, stop doing that. You got to be willing to walk away from it. So God can make you. How many of you know there's some stuff you need to let go of? Real talk. Yeah. See, look around. You're not by yourself, so you ain't weird. You ain't strange. But look at somebody and say, at least I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm so glad I'm moving. I might be limping. I might do two steps forward and one step back. But I'm moving. And he's blessing my movements. He's giving me things I know I, I feel like I don't deserve. Wow, Holy Spirit. He said, even though you feel like you don't deserve, it's been planned. It was waiting on you. It's one of these messages that's so hard to let you go because I want to make sure you heard me. Because I think this, this, ain't, this ain't a message for February. This ain't a message for March. No, this is a message for Tuesday. That you got to make some difficult decisions in this season that might make you appear heartless to some. But you got to do it the way he said it. That sometimes you got to look at people you love and say, I'll be back. Let me go get what I need to get. I'll be back. Bow your heads for me. Oh, I need to get that in your heart. You are not abandoning. You're not. You're not abandoning. I'm just going to go get better for us. I'll be back. I'll be back. Let me go. I'll be back. Encourage me. I'll be back. Wish me well so it don't hurt so bad to leave you. I promise you, I'll be back. I'll be back. Been like we used to, but I'll be back. Hmm. If there's anybody in the place who didn't give your life to Christ earlier and you're ready right now, you don't have to come down front. You just got to put your hand in the air for me for a few seconds so I can see you. If that's you, you need him to make this move. Is there another in the house today? Holy Spirit, I need you to be a little more tangible for us today. 
because I feel like I dropped our folk off at a crossroad. And though we sat quietly during the sermon, we feel very emotional right now. As we know, we're getting ready to be confronted with some tough decisions. Let us tap into your courage. So we can do what's right, not what's convenient. Make a leader out of me. Make a leader out of me. Not popular, but a leader. So that we can come out of this. Father, we're not just doing it for us. We're doing it for them. Give us strength to move forward. In Jesus' name. I love y'all.